Hi, for those of you new here, this is Evolution Simulation Game The Sapling, my solo indie game project. It's a game where you can basically do two types of things. On the one hand, there are a number of scenarios tasking you to design an ecosystem that meets specific requirements. On the other, there's a sandbox where you can build your own plants and animals, turn on random mutations and see how they evolve. In this series, consisting of six videos, I showcase the development and content for the third big update for the game. I started building a game about ecosystems and evolution because it was the most exciting game concept I could think of. And obviously, I still feel that way. There's one thing about ecosystems and evolution, however, that makes it less appropriate for a game. There's no concept of progress. For almost all simulation games I can think of, an important part of the fun is starting small and then building up something big, whether it's a space agency, a city, a theme park or a factory. Ecosystems do not naturally evolve to be bigger or better, even worse, when they're successful, they might not change at all. So how do I keep players interested in what's going to happen next? How do I inject a bit of variety? I think the answer to that is seasons. With the introduction of seasons, you can have, possibly large, fluctuations in groundwater, wind strength and temperature, and the plants and animals in a world will need to somehow deal with that. The most obvious way to make that possible, of course, is to add extra ways for them to deal with more extreme conditions. For example, for plants, so far the main thing that prevented them from living in really cold or hot temperatures were flowers. To fix that, I added an extra flower that can deal with colder temperatures and two extra that can deal with warmer temperatures. For animals, I added a second, thicker fur option, which was surprisingly hard to get right visually. Let me explain why. To start with, the 3D models for long hanging hair strands didn't look right for some reason. I tried one strand, two strands, three strands. Only after I figured out that I needed to add smaller substrands, things started to look better. Next up was merging these models into the animal. For that to look good, the rotation of the strand model needs to match the rotation of the place I want to merge it with. Unfortunately, my trigonometry skills related to rotations had gone a bit rusty, so I had to refresh my understanding of sinus and cosinus to make that work. Next, as you may remember from earlier videos, the animal creation happens with simplified low poly models that are smoothed at the end of the process to look less blocky. It turned out my implementation of this smoothing algorithm, Catmull Clark subdivision, could not handle flat surfaces like the hanging hair strands, so I had to redo parts of the smoothing code to make that happen. Finally, this merging obviously does not work in places where there already is a lag, so the long fur wouldn't really be visible for creatures with a lot of legs. I've solved this by including a small separate hair strand object behind the legs. So now plants and animals will be able to survive in more conditions. However, if you've played this game for a while, you know that organisms designed to be able to survive in more conditions, let's call them generalists, are rarely the most optimal for one specific environment. So for example, say we have a planet with a hot and a cold season. A plant that might be able to survive on both seasons will probably not be optimal for one season. There are two ways to actually be optimal for one season and not die in the other, and which one is the best depends on the lifespan of the organism. For smaller plants and animals with short lifespans, the solution is to simply delay getting born until the right season. For both seeds and eggs, you can now specify a minimum and maximum temperature, and a plant or animal inside will simply not get born outside that range. The result is that in the extreme seasons, the land will be empty, but then suddenly, life erupts. While adding this functionality to seeds, I took the opportunity to also make it faster, as the spreading of seeds was one of the slowest parts of the simulation. Before, I was simulating the movement of each individual seed at each point in time. Now, instead, once a seed is released, the simulation immediately decides where it will land at what point in the future and puts it on some sort of to-do list for that time and location. So say, a plant at cell 5 releases a seed at day 1. This new system will immediately decide it will land on cell 7 at day 4, put it on the list of things to do at day 4, and then forgets about it until it actually is day 4 and it checks that to-do list again. Because this new system is so much faster and convenient to work with, I immediately started to use it in other places in the code as well. For example, eggs are also placed in a cell and should do something in that cell after a few days. For eggs, the action is of course not growing into a plant, but hatch, but the underlying system is the same. Same for carrion, but now the action is disappear. The other strategy for organisms with longer lifespans is shutting down during unfavorable seasons. If your flowers can't handle a particular wind strength, just lose them for the time being. If your leaves can't handle a particular temperature, just lose them. 
This of course comes at the cost of no energy input for a while, but as the proverb goes, taking a break is better than dying. Animals can shut down too, in the form of hibernation or estivation, which is the same thing during a hot period. Obviously the animals will need shelter for this, and this I am adding in the form of nests. I have explained several times before that from many hours of watching people play the game, I have learned to avoid adding invisible systems to the simulation. Instead, a more complex simulation is only fun if you can easily tell what is going on. Nests are of course the perfect kind of system for that. In fact, I actually already wanted to add them during the previous update, when I introduced eggs, but I also wanted the whole update out of the door before the birth of my youngest daughter, which is quite an inflexible deadline, so I couldn't squeeze it in. Nests evolve in two stages. The first open stage only hides the eggs from predators, the second one also allows for hibernation and estivation. The nests we are looking at right now consist of twigs and can be made by all animals at the cost of energy, but there are two other nest types for which you need special body parts. Burrows can only be dug by some of the limbs in the game. For really fast nest building I've added these spade like hands. Oh, and a side note, these eyes are also new, and a tribute to speculative evolution YouTuber Bibliridian. The third and final nest type is made of wax, inspired by bees and wasps, and can only be made by animals that eat nectar. This means that you will most likely only see this nest type evolve in a world where flowers have emerged first, which is an idea I kinda like. Whenever I add a bit of extra complexity to the game, like the nests and hibernation mechanics that I just explained, I am constantly worrying about how I am going to teach all this to the player. I mean, I can come up with cool mechanics all I want, but if nobody gets it, I might as well not have implemented it. Indeed, during playtesting sessions, my expectations about what is clear and what is not are proven wrong all the time. One thing I could have done to communicate that you can only hibernate in closed nests is to add a tutorial step with a long text box explanation. But I don't know about you, but I personally rarely take the time to actually read tutorial text boxes. Instead, I'm always on the lookout for more intuitive ways to communicate how a system works. One day, while cycling home, I realized that all of the hibernation mechanic could actually be explained by one simple addition to the UI. If your animal does not build a closed nest, the hibernation slider simply becomes transparent. That's all, hibernation does not apply. In hindsight, it's so simple it's hard to believe that I didn't do it this way from the beginning. Interestingly, the new optimized system I introduced for seeds, eggs and carrion was also useful here, as again this is something you put in a location that should expire after some time. I had to extend it a little bit to allow for multiple eggs in one nest though. Of course, for the twig and wax nests, it's also possible to build them in trees if the animals can climb or fly. This sparked an interesting question however. What should a flying species do when there are no trees around? Do they die out or build their nests on the ground? For now I've picked a ladder because playtesters always clearly show frustration when species die out because of something that is hard for them to control, but it does look a bit weird. With hibernation we have filled the last box of this little matrix. As you can see, 4 special behaviors for harsher conditions. What exactly is a harsh condition differs per organism, so as long as you create varied seasons, you should see different plants and animals react differently at different times. This way, even when you are watching a successful ecosystem, in the player's mind there should always be the question of what will happen next. If this video made you want to play the game, you can. The game is available in early access on Steam and Itch. I aim to release the features presented in this video on the beta branch on August 16. If all works out as intended and I manage to fix the most annoying bugs, a full release will follow a month later on September 13.